And we can move right down to delegations. We have Dr. Ram is with us, and he's going to talk to us about the new medical clinic that we're getting in Drumheller. Very exciting times. You'll have to push the little button with the face on it. There you go. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Council, for allowing us the opportunity to come and speak to you on this gorgeous Tuesday afternoon outside. I think it was plus 15 when we came in. So... As Mary Emin mentioned, so we're here to, to give you a first presentation, first look at what's going to be called Riverside Medical, which is going to be the, the new uh, medical clinic for Drumheller. And I know I've, I said Patients Medical Home, and that'll make a bit more sense as we move through it. And those are just some of the individuals that have been involved in, in making this process what it is right now. So I've done lots of presentations and various research aspects and conferences and we always have to declare if there's any conflict so other than wanting to improve the the health of ourselves and the services in Drumheller there's no other conflicts of interest that we have. So I thought I'd start with the health needs assessment or health survey that was done uh, in March 2017 it was independently commissioned independently run by Abacus Data and actually did hit well over the number of participants that Abacus Data was actually hoping to get, actually two and a half times more. So we actually, actually managed to get 1,306 residents of the Drumheller and area. So just a little bit of data. It did run for just under three weeks. The general demographics of, of everyone that responded, uh, it was about 75, about Three quarters were female, but there were the chunk of males there. And we had a reasonable spread as far as age goes, and this is based on information that Abacus was expecting on the various other surveys that they do across the country. So just some quick key findings. So uh, it was very nice to hear that most of the residents of the community were actually quite satisfied with the quality of care that they were getting, whether it was outside or inside of the hospital. But, of course, there were specific areas that they did have concerns with and were hoping to see some improvement. So wait times is something that is across the country, probably not too different here, but 81% had some dissatisfaction with that. The process of booking appointments, they had some, about 66%. And then the number of physicians or the choice of physicians in town. 51% of the residents who did complete the survey, again, were satisfied, but... It was pretty evenly split as far as resources and services that they wanted available to themselves here in the community. And it was consistent as far as this particular statistic came out across the gender and age. And those without a family doctor in town were far more likely uh, to be dissatisfied with servicing. And I think that can be a uh, very obvious and reasonable point that was made. So by a pretty staggering ratio of six to one, residents were more likely to think healthcare in the community was getting worse at that time rather than getting better. And most thought that there hasn't been very many changes or improvements, good or bad, in the last 12 months. One in four of those who completed the consultation didn't have a family physician in town. 72% of those who finished that they had a family physician in, in Drumheller, whereas the rest of them actually had family physicians that they traveled anywhere between half an hour to an hour and a half to see whether it was routine or whether it was urgent appointments. The major things that came out, which mirror some of the items that I mentioned already, is 90% felt that Drumheller needed more physicians. Uh, a good chunk of the community felt that they wanted physicians that were living in town, had their families here, that they needed options, that they did need an extra clinic to actually provide either the time, the physicians, or the space. And they wanted more female physicians. And as you can see, about three quarters of the respondents were female. So that probably ties into how that 70% was. For the wait times, about half felt that wait times of five days or less would be very acceptable as far as routine appointments. 29% felt 10 days, and then 14% uh, 15. When it came to urgent appointments, 76% wanted to see them the same day, which I think is completely reasonable given, given what an urgent appointment means, at least for me and what I think a patient needs for me. This was shocking. Uh, so 60% of respondents said they had to wait on average 12.6 days for an urgent appointment. So this was to see a family physician in the clinic, not to obviously wait 12.6 days to see someone in the emergency department. 
And this, again, mirrors a couple of the items that I mentioned earlier. So that, in general, healthcare was, was heading in, in the opposite direction of what they would like to have as far as their health goes. So where does that leave the community? And by community, I mean all of us. I mean me. I mean uh, the rest of my delegation here. We, we work here. We live here. I'm, I'm a patient of, of physicians in the community. So where does that kind of information leave us? So that leaves us leading into this direction. So for those of you that aren't familiar with what a patient's medical home is, this is the initiative that is hopefully going to be sweeping across North America and the country. So it's something that is sought for and looked at as far as all the provincial and national colleges, as far as the Alberta Health Services and the various zones and areas across Alberta and the rest of the country. So what, what makes up a patient's medical home? And some of this you may, may seem to seem like it was more intuitive than anything else. So it involves a number of things. So one is patient-centered care. And that, uh, for, for most people, makes complete sense. But it is something that sometimes is lacking. And that takes the form of whether patients are waiting to make the appointments, difficulty booking, or waiting to get the results. They need a personal family physician. And by that, I mean they have their own dedicated family physician that is giving them that continuity of care. And whether that's continuity over time, whether it's continuity over different locations that they're in. So for example, from the clinic to the hospital, that is something that we know will improve how their health is going to be moving forward. They need team-based care. So again, this is something that has been starting to roll out in the last 10 years. And this is where the primary care networks came in. And this is where the, uh, the province has initiated more of that team support. And this is not just in the hospital, this is also in the, in the community. Timely access. So I think we saw some of the data and some of the respondents of what timely access means to, to the community. Timely access, the goal for timely access is same day appointments all the time, every day for your family physician. That is, that is the goal. Comprehensive care. So it means a one stop shop. So that's to see your family physician. That's if you need extra help and support, if, it, if you have someone that has diabetes or hypertension, that means everything is in one place and it's very easy, very convenient and more efficient. And I touched on the continuum of care, but that's being able to provide your care in the clinic as well as to the hospital and beyond. It requires ongoing education, training and, and research. So as physicians, like most other professionals, we have to keep up with everything that's happening on a daily basis. I can tell you that it's very difficult, but that's what we signed up for. And we also need the support of the municipality, so Drumheller, Alberta Government, Alberta Health, Alberta Health Services. So all of those pieces come together uh, as far as providing the support any clinic needs if they want to hope to be a patient's medical home. So probably wondering how many other rural communities have this and they look and feel like simple points in order to make sure that a patient's health is going to be the best that it can be. But I can tell you it is, has been it's a challenge and it's very difficult to change either the mindsets, the process or even the physical aspects of how a clinic is actually run and how a patient flows through it. There is actually only one and this is actually a place that was probably one of the first patient-centered medical homes in Canada. It's actually been modeled. Uh, I, was, I was there recently and they actually had to go up and make presentations up to the territories because they were using this particular clinic to model their entire way that they were doing health. And it is Tabor. And it is an absolute amazing clinic. It, the, the process, how they how they see patients, the manner of booking, they have same day appointments for everything. It is a one stop shop. They provide continuum of care. They have done quite a job there. And that was through all of the partnerships they had with, with the town, with the community, with the doctors. It's been recognized and recommended nationally and internationally. Um, and it is the only one. And for now, it will be the only one. There's going to be one more and we're gonna we're gonna build that here. So I would argue that how much is Drumheller value health? I mean, like I said, I'm I live I'm a drumheller. So I value it more than just because I'm a physician. I value it more just because I have patients that I see could could get better care, could get more timely access, could actually get more efficient care. I value it quite a bit. And I'm hoping that all of you and Drumheller values it just as much. So we heard from 
at least a good chunk of the community on as far as the survey goes on on what they feel they need i do plan to do a, a follow-up to that probably in about a year it's regular occurrence whether it's in academia whether it's in health to actually do the needs assessments to actually decide well you told us what was actually bothering you what you actually needed to to see improved and obviously if a year or two from now we repeat if we haven't done much better then then at least we know we can continue to to try to make that better so the roots of it, so this wasn't an easy, easy project by any stretch of the imagination. I can tell you that it's been about four weeks and two days since we went into the third floor of the Riverside building there. And in about you know, three weeks and five days, it will be ready to go. So it's going to be the probably the fastest, actually I know, it's going to be the fastest uh, ground up started clinic probably in, in anywhere in Alberta and it's 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 going to be very very nice it's going to be staged in phases and if it wasn't for all these individuals sitting back here behind me and then all the ones that are mentioned in here the it would it would not be happening and I've leaned on them entirely for this time period I'll continue to do so and I'm hoping that when it is up and running the community will see what a great job that they have all done so, but that's not where we're going to end. So it's not just going to open up in that, in that time period. And then we just kind of go along and run our business as needed. So things that are coming up, as I said, in order to be a patient's medical home, it has to be a one-stop shop. So in phase one, uh, Ray Anscoff and Riverside Pharmacy will be having a pharmacy in-house in the clinic. So as far as that goes, as far as all of my elderly and geriatric population, no longer will they have to come to the clinic, get a prescription, have it faxed off, or have Ray actually go out and drive it to them. They'll be able to get it right, right when they come in and right when they leave. They'll be able to leave and have that all done right away. Other things that are going to happen as we move forward is I know a lot of patients that I have personally, they are either single parents or both parents work all through the day and trying to take a day off of work to actually come in and see your physician is incredibly difficult and that's something I can't do as a patient. So we're going to be extending uh, hours into the evenings to start and then potentially or actually over the weekend as well. And I'll caution that that's not going to happen on day one. That's going to happen uh, through the next couple of months or ne probably new the next six months as it as it progresses and, and new physicians come and join us the question is going to come out I imagine uh, these new physicians where are they coming from so they're all uh, Canadian born Canadian grads that are new grads that will be starting uh, as of July August and September so that's how those new physicians will be rolled into the community and I'm very excited and they're very excited all of them so far that have come in for interviews have loved the community already and we've interviewed them and they're they're very excited to come in obviously and see how things go and then decide how their forever plans are going to move forward after that something that we are very excited that we will be sending out this week as well is that every new venture needs an identity and that identity in this particular form is going to be that of a logo and we're going to have actually students under the age of 18 in all the schools in Drumhill and the surrounding area provide or at least hopefully provide their example what they feel an appropriate identity or logo for this clinic is going to be and you'll be seeing that shortly and hopefully in the next next week get rolled out so I'm very excited to hopefully have a grade one or two year old as I uh, finish that up but obviously it'll go into the to the group and they'll decide so again, thank you. Um, I appreciate the time being able to come in this afternoon to present this to you. And as everything progresses and we move on and forward, I'm hoping that I'll be able to come back and give you an update at some point. I will take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Dr. Ram. And uh, thank you for your you know, investment in the community. This is something I think this is pretty exciting times for Drumheller to have this type of care coming in, not just for Drumheller, but Drumheller and area when we're looking at the 33,000 people that we support. So this is something I think it, it's incredible. So, questions? Jay, comments? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, first, let me say, Dr. Ram, how much I admire anybody who's willing to uh, pay what it costs to upset uh, what is a very comfortable but unsatisfactory status quo. Uh, it's comfortable to some and uh, unacceptable to most of us. And I admire you willing to take on that stand. I'm, I'm sure it came at some tremendous personal cost. The uh, uh, things I'd like to know is ultimately, 
perhaps not on day one, but a year after operations, how many physicians do you hope to have in-house? So our hope and goal as far as the number of physicians is a bit of a moving number, and I'll explain that to you in, 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 in this way. So family physicians we know across Canada in the rural areas are lacking. So primary preventive health we know can not only improve the health of the community, but also save an enormous amount of healthcare dollars. So in my mind, we need somewhere between five and nine primary care physicians that are going to be completing that, that clinic. Now, the second part of that is I was born and raised in Camrose. And I remember growing up that if I needed to see an orthopedic surgeon, because if I needed to have surgery, I didn't have to actually travel the 50 minutes off to Edmonton to actually see them, and then 50 minutes back, back for the surgery. There, this was opportunities and services that specialists would come and do, whether it was in cameras or Tasman. This is something we plan to do uh, within the next few months. So not specialists that will be necessarily coming, living on a regular basis in Drumheller, but for example, a pediatrician that could actually come and provide that extra outpatient we call service to to the patients that we have into the community. So the number of family physicians think will be up to nine, but then we have a number of different specialists that we'd like to come and provide outpatient service. Thank you. Could you give me a few examples of what a doctor would think, just so I understand? I'll be asked a million questions about your presentation. I want to make sure I do a good job, uh, not just having to send them all back to just answer have you answered them directly? What's what's the difference between a, an urgent appointment and a routine appointment as a doctor sees it? As a doctor sees it, a routine appointment, I guess a concrete example is someone who has stable blood pressure, but they're on medications. So they don't need any changes, don't need any adjustments. They really just got to the end of the year and they need refill. So uh, as a plain example, that would probably be a, a routine appointment. An urgent appointment is uh, if I pick someone who's in school and, you know, they their parents are deciding if they're going to be missing school as a result of having a cold, flu, pneumonia, what have you, then in my mind, that's an urgent appointment because I don't want my kids to miss school. So I want them, if they happen to need to see a physician and need any extra care or antibiotics, then I would want them to be seen urgently, not necessarily emergently in, right. the, in the hospital, but urgently. And as a physician, as someone who believes in a patient-centered medical home, either of those appointments should be same day. And instead, the survey would say, if it's factually accurate, that instead people were waiting almost two weeks, perhaps when that issue may have resolved itself. Yeah. Yeah. On average, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, I just want to say thank you. And, uh, and from my own family's experience, I know we, we felt incredibly cared for uh, and looked after. Uh, the doctor who delivered my second child was our family physician for a number of years. But, but when they retire... Uh, and you see this uh, across the board, we're abandoned. There was no succession plan. There was no referral. There was a uh, fend for yourself. And uh, and as a male, that, meant, that means that I've taken an absolutely passive approach to my own health for at least two years now because I don't have a doctor anymore. And, uh, and so I, uh, I personally welcome your, the opening of your clinic. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it sounds very good. Um, certainly all in favor of it, and, and it almost sounds a little too good to be true, however. Um, and, and I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if, if it looks so good, then why is there only one other? Why aren't there hundreds of these all across the country? Uh, well, like, what's stopping that? The... Well, so the very comfortable answer is, like most things, uh, everything runs on some kind of business model. So uh, I was speaking with some of my colleagues, uh, probably while I was in Tabor a couple of weeks ago, about about this very similar, very similar question. And it's it's hard to co to convince any particular discipline that what you've been doing for many many years. There is a way to do it better. There is a way where you don't lose that financial drive or incentive, and it is ultimately going to be better for your professional uh, image overall. So that is a very difficult thing to overcome. And the second aspect that I briefly mentioned earlier is trying to retrofit any of the hundreds of clinics that have been running a certain way for all of this time is also a very significant financial hit that 
a lot of physicians are, aren't willing to do. Uh, we did see that over the last 10 years as far as the rollout of electronic medical records, and it's probably a staggering, but there's at least a good 20 to 25% of Alberta that does not have electronic medical records in their family physician clinics. And there's been lots of support, both financial as well as uh, as well as IT support to help those clinics do it, but they still have it. So it's it's a battle, and it's something that I believe the leadership of uh, primary care, leadership of rural medicine, are continuing to fight for. And I think they they will win, but it will be a slow win. Uh, yeah, I echo a lot of what has been said. That you know, congratulations, and looking forward to this. Um, just back to the numbers, it's a, in, in your survey, one in four uh, who were surveyed didn't have a family physician. Do you have any idea how that compares province-wide or, you know, is that a good number, a bad number? Or? If it was, you know, one in ten, if it was two percent, in my mind, that's always a bad number. So it's, uh, I think that number is probably... Not completely accurate, only because recently we found out that the area has probably bled about ten or 11,000 people outside of what we believe we have been serving. So if I compare uh, what our catchment area is for general services, it's around 33,000, I believe. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I know from being involved uh, in the primary care network, I'm one of the, I'm the vice chair of this particular area, that According to that, those numbers in the last couple of years, we've been servicing health-wise around 20 to 23,000. So obviously there's a staggering deficit in that number. So it's, it's one in four don't have a family physician, your original question. I think that's, that's a bad number regardless of how it, how it looks to the rest of the province. I, I wouldn't be able to quote, I don't want to guess on what the number is in various communities because there's various different aspects to go into play of how that number is. But either way, it's, it's something that needs to be improved continue. Um, uh, over the years, we've always heard rural communities have trouble with attracting and retaining physicians and kind of sounds like you've got a magic bullet in a way. Um, is there a strategy or is there a way to sell the community or even things that we could do to help with that? Or, Well, I mean, I can give, I can give the story of how I, I got here. So as I mentioned, I was born and raised in Camrose. When I left Camrose, I went off to Edmonton and I did my electrical engineering degree there. And then from Edmonton, moved down to Calgary and did both the medical degree as well as a PhD down there and completed the rest of my residency training program. I'll be honest and say when I left Camrose, there was, there was probably no hope of me ever going back to rural Alberta. In hindsight, that was just me thinking my teenage brain, but it was something that was never going to happen. So moving forward, when I went into training, I had a very young family. Uh, I had a a uh, wife that's also in medical training, medical school at the time, but a uh, one-year-old and a three-year-old. So when I was looking to do part of our mandatory rural rotations, I saw rural as something that I needed to be as close to Calgary as possible so that I can obviously still be there and be able to come back to my family. I had a colleague that did her mandatory rotation actually in Drumheller a number of years ago. So I asked her, she saw it. I was, I was heard how she, she loved the community. She loved being here. She lived here for that whole year and wished that she could come back, but there was uh, other personal family reasons where she couldn't. So she said, you know, definitely you need to need to go there. So I spent uh, the first four days of my first time in Drumheller since I was probably in junior high going to the museum and every day things got better. So it wasn't just the fact that I liked the medicine more, that I had more interest, or that uh, there was something else. I, to this day, I can't really put a finger on it, and we often talk about it around the dinner table. But it's, I remember going back, or maybe my wife remembers me going back to Calgary after that first week, and she said, you're smiling. I, said, Are, I think you're actually happy with what you're doing. And I said, well, I think you're right. And, you know, I, I know you want me to be able to say that there was a number of different reasons or factors that you could highlight and you can expand on and say, these are the reasons why we need to attract physicians here. I think part of it is going to be, uh, I guess, for those of you who have seen it, like the, the field of dreams as far as medicine goes. You know, if you, if you build a clinic that the new generation of doctors actually want to practice in, and it's a way that they believe they can provide the best and most appropriate care to their patients. And it also provides a way that they can get that elusive balance in medicine, then they will come. So 
this is what we're going to do. And I believe regardless of how it gets rolled out, how fast and when things kind of come through, I believe this will attract Canadian graduates of this next generation and they will come to Drummond. Anyone else? Lisa? Just like to applaud you for taking the initiative to move forward on this in our community. Um, I was one of the 1,300 women that uh, <laughs> built up that, uh, that poll, and uh, my own thoughts echoed most of what was presented here tonight from you. Um, but I've got a question in regards to Tabor. Is that the only clinic Tabor has, or was was that a community kind of grounded um, grasp to try to get more medical care to their community before AHS, or how? How was that? Yeah, so as of right now, that is the that is the single clinic in, in Tabor. And having seen it now, I can't imagine that you'd ever want to do anything else but, but work there if you were in Tabor. It was a very, very long process. So I had a, a, a brief but good meeting with the general manager of that clinic. And it was over many, many years, well over 10 years, of them trying to figure out how they could actually get the partnerships actually get the buy-in from the physicians. And uh, I know that personally, having trying to work through and get physicians to change their mind on various meaningless things, that trying to get a physician to change their mind on something that important takes quite a bit of time. So mm -hmm. uh, it was quite a bit of time and, and process to get them to do that. So was there any models in the States or in Europe that kind of are sort of based on the same, same process? Or? Yeah, so there are various other things uh, across the world that incorporate this patient's medical home feel. In every jurisdiction, Canada, we're unique. Uh, we can't necessarily compare ourselves to the U.S. because we just don't have the litigious mm -hmm. nature that they have down there. So it's, it's a little bit different. And obviously the, the model and the level of how compensation is done there makes it quite a bit different as well. But if we take the theme and the flavor of what primary preventive medicine wants to do across the world, then it is very similar in, lo in lots of different places. Awesome. And I'd just like to say on the extended evening hours, yay. You know, I'm one of those working moms that when my child's sick, it's hard for me to get away from work to take her to, to see a doctor. So, yeah, again, I applaud you and, and thanks for bringing this to John. Thank you. I th I'm glad that you're here, and I think it's a great idea. I just like to ask you're talking about evening hours. Are you going to have like a walk-in clinic? Is that would that be? I know that uh, Silver Lake has asked for a walk-in clinic, and and they had a hard time getting it through Alberta Health Services. So it took a long time. So is that would that be part of of the evening hours, or would it be appointed certain appointments? Would yeah. Be so it it would function more like a walk-in that way. Anybody could could come. Uh, and then we have a number of different unique ways where patients are going to be able to book appointments and that would include seeing if the walk-in is busy and what time they should be there and i don't want to share all the big secrets i'll save that for the next time i see you but the, there are going to be some unique ways that that is going to happen but it will function more like more like a walk-in that way they don't have to actually book in to see their family physician on, on those particular days at least for now uh, everything is uh, a moving target so just because these are the best general themes and ways that uh, primary preventive care can be provided in any community, every community is slightly different. So we'll have to see how the, what community thinks about about all this and move forward with what's best. So have you got Amanda Hemming hook yet? To come back to drum? Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, again. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation and thank you for your commitment to our community. This is exciting times for Drummond area. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, everyone.